Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 88, Sharks with Melissa Marquez. Yeah, currently Eric, uh, our our wonderful, wonderful editor, is one mile away from where they filmed the movie Jaws. Uh, there have been a bunch of shark sightings happening at our favorite beaches here on Long Island, and uh, it's Shark Week. It is actually Shark Week, and we are very excited not just to bring you an expert in sharks, an actual expert about actual shark animals in mm-hmm. here in the world, uh, but also someone who studies the folklore of her subject as like part of her career. Melissa is one of my favorite people now, even though we just met the day that we recorded this episode, and I think she's amazing. Yeah, she was incredibly cool, incredibly well-spoken, and the topic that she's chosen to uh, investigate and study is just one of the coolest things I've ever told people like about, and I'm really excited for her. We are also really excited to welcome our newest patrons, Sam, Jessica, Brittany, Morgan, and Saint Sweet Sir Stereo. What a name. That is quite a name. As well as our supporting producer-level patrons, Philip, Julie, Christina, Josh, Eeyore, Ella, Ashley Marie, Neil, Jessica, Maria, Ryan, Phil Fresh, and Deborah. They all never get sand in their flip-flops when they first get to the beach, and so they have to immediately take the flip-flops off, but then the sand is too hot and it burns the bottom of your feet. That never happens to them. Oh, yeah. Never. Ever, ever, ever. Nope. And uh, folks who can walk on sand of any temperature at any time would be our legend-level patrons. Cassie, Sandra, Audra, Mercedes, Jack Marie, and Leanne Davis. Yeah, they are all wonderful, wonderful human beings who have feet made of steel. Absolutely. Julie, what are we drinking during this episode? Shark Bites, which is a wonderful, wonderful cocktail that if you are a um, patron and you get the recipe cards, that is what our recipe card is this week. Yeah, every single week, Julia makes delicious cocktails, one alcoholic and one non-alcoholic for those that support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash spirits podcast. They are great and you should check them out. Yeah. Um, Also, this week we are sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can learn and teach just about anything. Visit skillshare.com slash spirits to get two months of Skillshare premium for just 99 cents. And we'll tell you a little bit more about our favorite class this week later on the episode. That's less than a popsicle, yo. It is definitely less than a popsicle. <laughs> Julia just, just threw me, me off there, but like, yeah, it is. That's she just gave true. me an empty nod. I was thinking about walking back from the beach. She passed an ice cream truck anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking um, of the, the push-up popsicles, the ones that oh, like, yeah. you have as kids that you just throw in the freezer and there's multiple flavors, but they all taste the same. Yeah, we would go through like two Costco boxes of those per mm-hmm. week in my house. <laughs> Checks out. Uh, We would also love to remind you that there are transcripts available for all new episodes, as well as a link to our merch and an about page, a press page. If you know someone who writes articles about podcasts and you want to be like, yo, my favorite podcast is Spirits, and you can give them that link to spiritspodcast.com. So thanks again to Melissa for joining us. We really, really had a fun time with this episode, and we think you're going to as well. And you can find all her info, as with all of our guests, in the description of this podcast to follow her on Twitter. She's excellent there. Yeah. And without further ado, enjoy Spirits Podcast, Episode 88, Sharks with Melissa Marquez. We are so delighted to be joined by Melissa today, who is going to tell us some very interesting stories about sharks. Melissa, how did you come to specialize in sharks and what do you do for a living? (laughs) So, hi guys. Uh, I'm a Latina marine biologist and wildlife educator, and I have a bachelor's degree in marine ecology and conservation from Florida in the United States, and then moved across the world to New Zealand to get my master's in marine biology. My parents kind of joke that my love affair with marine biology started when I was a baby, and The Little Mermaid was the only movie that would shut me up at three o'clock in the morning. Uh. (laughs) I feel really bad for my dad. Sorry. And uh, yeah, just... During my undergraduate degree, I was really lucky to travel all over the world and participate in a lot of shark research, which uh, kind of cemented my love for wildlife predators. And I've always been interested in misunderstood predators. And I feel like sharks are the most misunderstood of all because they just get have such a bad rap that they really don't deserve. 
Mm -hmm. And so I'm currently in Sydney, Australia, in between a master's degree and looking for a PhD. But right now I'm looking at chondrichthian, which is the sharks, skates, rays, and the chimeras. Uh, So I'm looking at chondrichthian depictions in folklores and myths, and I'm interested in seeing how people form attitudes towards predators, uh, specifically land predators versus marine predators like sharks, and then seeing if the larger region's public opinion matches the local folklore or myth, and if that perception of these animals sways conservation initiatives. Okay, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard, ever. (laughs) That is the coolest thing in the world. And you're also a podcaster, is that right? I am a podcaster, yeah. Um, I run Conciencia Azul, which is a completely Spanish marine science podcast where I get to interview uh, Spanish-speaking marine scientists, students, photographers, videographers from all around the world talking about their science, essentially. Oh, that is so awesome. Cool. And so I think fun. we actually do have a lot of listeners who would be super into that. Yay! Yeah, it's I'm I'm really happy with what I'm doing both podcast wise and also this kind of pet project of mine, just because I'm diff- mm-hmm. learning a lot about not only different sciences that are going around the world, but also a lot about the different cultures in the animals worldwide. And I keep getting a constant, whoa, I didn't know that. And it, that makes this kind of research so interesting to me. That is definitely the best feeling when you're doing research and you're like, oh my God, I never knew that before. How did I not know that? Exactly, exactly. (laughs) And for me, it's interesting because nowadays uh, a large majority of people are afraid of sharks and sharks weren't always feared. In fact, back in the days, uh, they were often treated like gods and Mm -hmm. recognizing that the world didn't always have this universal fear of sharks. I really wanted to know how people went from having spiritual connections with these animals to many people painting them as villains. That's so cool. I'm just like still overwhelmed by how cool this whole topic is. And I love to this kind of burgeoning um, online community of science communicators, because like science is astounding. But when you get to like, you know, understand the facts and understand that narrative in the broader you know experience of the world like that to me is when science becomes like freaking incredible is when it um you know intersects with and shapes my understanding of my like daily and lived experience because like everything is science um so i i think it makes so much sense for um you know scientists to do the kind of anthropological cultural historical research um you know that people normally do like not in the field yeah i mean i definitely think that I mean, science communication has always been around to a degree, but I think it's becoming a lot more popular now because we are starting to realize how important the general public is. And I'm not saying they haven't always been important. It's more of you need the general public to have a degree of science literacy in order to be a wiser community and make better choices. And that's so important Mm -hmm. nowadays. And so... I am a very big proponent of getting rid of jargon, getting rid of those big words. Um, I love open access journals. Like I think any kind of research we do should be available for whoever's interested in reading it because then what's the point of doing it if you just kind of share it with just an exclusive a group like what what's the point of that right um mm-hmm. you're leaving a large majority out so i definitely think we're going to see a lot more collaborations and not only between scientists and science communicators but also across other uh, degrees as well uh, like you were saying amanda i think it's really really important that we start having marriages between these subjects yeah and like how many uh other young girls and black and brown girls are going to be interested in being like navigators and you know other kinds of like marine related uh occupations after seeing moana like mm. there's, there's not just one example of cool uh ocean movies anymore it, exactly and i mean it's one of those things is why i'm such a uh i really am a champion for minorities and women specifically latina women just because i am latina Uh, But I grew up with not knowing any Latina marine biologists. In fact, I knew very little marine biologists who were female, period, besides Sylvia Earle and Eugenie Clark, which Eugenie Clark is Mm -hmm. famous specifically for sharks. And so I actually did a whole entire TED Talk 
talking about uh, sharks and female scientists more alike than you think. So both really being there, but not getting the spotlight that they kind of deserve um, and mm -hmm. talking about why diversity is so important. So, yeah, I think that the more science communicators we have, the better, because it allows these upcoming generations to see themselves among these leaders. And I think that's really important. That's amazing. And we'll absolutely link to your talk as well as Conciencia Azul in the description of this podcast. Thank you. I guess I want to kind of dive into the folklore aspect of your research now. Uh, you did touch on it slightly before, but I think that uh, I guess we could start with maybe the stories that sort of got you into this area of research to begin with. Like, what was the first story that grabbed your attention and made you think, wow, this is, you know, this is something that happens throughout the world. And this is the topic that I want to focus on. Yeah, um, I think the first that came or kind of what planted the idea in my head was mm -hmm. the fact that there is a large majority of people that are afraid of sharks, even mm -hmm. with the science out there saying that it's such a low probability of you ever having an encounter with a shark, let alone a fatal one. And mm -hmm. just close your eyes and think about sharks one second. What do you think of like automatically when you hear the word shark? I think of Jaws, mm -hmm. which is yeah, probably not the test. best situation. Yeah, no, but that's it. The majority of people think of Jaws some think of Sharknado now, um, even more. <laughs> oh, no. I'm so sorry for that. <laughs> I know. It, it pains me. It pains me. But hey, they had, they had pretty good diversity in that last movie with a lot of different sharks. There we go. So. But yeah, a lot of people <laughs> usually have a negative connotation to it. And Snapchat actually had a poll of over 250,000 votes and 64% of them voted, yes, they're still afraid of sharks, even with all of the facts. They're still afraid mm -hmm. of sharks. And mm -hmm. I was just brand new married and we were island hopping to go back to New Zealand because we lived in New Zealand at the time. And we stopped at Fiji and in the airport mm -hmm. or by the airport, there was a mural of the shark god, uh, Dakuwaka in mm -hmm. Fiji. And basically that, that shark god protects people when they're at sea and the coral reefs. And that's kind of when it started when I was like, huh, that's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've always been interested in mythology and folklore and uh, legends, but I never thought about it in regards to sharks until that moment. And so I started kind of collecting stories. And it was interesting because then I started thinking about the attitudes of people. And so, like I said earlier, I'm interested in seeing how people form attitudes towards the predators and how those attitudes mm -hmm. vary between land versus marine predators. And if that perception sways conservation initiatives, which leads me to the second part of my research, which is to see if the larger region's public opinion towards these animals actually matches the local folklore or myth. And then mm -hmm. the third part is seeing if the myth matches the animals. So the example of Dakuwaka protects people when they're at sea and the coral reefs. And yes, sharks do really keep coral reefs safe in a way. Uh, coral reefs are actually healthier if there are more sharks present. And because sharks control mid-sized predators who are either their prey or competitors, and actually shark poop is kind of like fertilizer for coral reefs <laughs> in a way. Right. And so that's so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And that's kind of an example of where shark worship and conservation initiatives align. Now, be it due to the belief in sharks and that spiritual connection or the belief in science, not exactly sure. But Fiji being home mm -hmm. to Dagawaka, the ancient shark god, um, Almost 70% of the around 75 species of elasmobranchs inhabiting those waters are considered threatened or endangered. So those island communities mm -hmm. actually responded by creating the Shark Reef Marine Reserve. And it's actually the first oh. official marine protected area or MPA for sharks in Fijian waters, which is amazing. I'm doing a little bit more research with these things to see if these kind of folklores and conservation measures line up uh, pretty nicely, especially in the Indo-Pacific islands, where a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, myths and legends are based out of. Um, and of course, not all folklore and conservation measures do line up so nicely. 
a lot of times on the show we'll talk about sort of the like intricacies and interwoven nature of humanity and folklore and also like the topics in which those folklore are you know uh focusing on and so i think this is really interesting because this is this is exactly up our alley this is the kind of what is leading into the other uh when it comes to these three topics like uh conservation the species and then the folklore and i think that is so on point for us and we're so glad to have you here <laughs> no i'm i'm glad to be talking about it uh, i think again i think mm-hmm. obviously it's pretty interesting and it's something mm-hmm. that a lot of people don't think about I think the art of passing down myths and legends and folklore is slowly starting to fade. And that makes me really sad because it's just such an integral part of a lot of societies. And so Mm -hmm. this is kind of my way of preserving some of that. I think it's, it's such an incredible mission. Um, as you were kind of asking us about our first image of sharks, um, it kind of struck me how, uh, how like, I don't know, human centered our view of animals currently is. Uh, and in, you know, older traditions that understood humans as like one part of a really interwoven ecosystem, you know, it's a lot easier to recognize that, you know, predators, like they have their place, just like we have our place, just like, you know, mealworms have their place as well, versus all these kind of images of sharks that we have that are so fraught. It's like sharks that are, you know, being imported or exploited or hunted or otherwise like in situations where like of course you would react in a violent way because who wouldn't um versus an understanding of the world that is a lot more holistic you know and then you see like yeah you know like big scary things can be our protectors if we don't see every single thing as a thing to be either you know conquered or like exploited by the human species yeah i mean in some legends they are painted as these fearsome sea monsters or tricksters but in the majority of them that i found so far they are these helpful sea gods that more often than not, protect people. And I think these myths and legends helped humankind understand the role of sharks in the world before we really knew any scientific facts about sharks. And to be fair, I I find these myths to be fun to read and kind of help us understand how our ancestors thought about sharks as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, the oral tradition is so important, especially when you're considering... It, the fact that it lends itself to understanding, hey, this is what our ancestors appreciated and what they respected and what was important to them at the time that these stories were being told. I went to the Tapapa Museum in Wellington, which is a free museum. I was like, holy crap, a free museum. Awesome. I would spend all my time. <laughs> More of those, please. Right, right? I know, I know. We went there and there's a whole entire section just about the Maori and their beliefs and talking about the haka and everything else. And one of the myths that was there was actually um, the Maori myth of Kawariki and the shark man. So Kawariki was a princess who fell in love with this peasant boy, essentially, named Tutira. And her father was a sorcerer king and was not happy about the matchup whatsoever. So he cursed Tutira mm-hmm. and turned him into a shark. The two actually still met in secret and would swim together at night. And one day there was a huge tsunami that destroyed the entire village and swept all of the villagers out to sea. And Tutira was still a shark and he actually saved the villagers and brought them back to shore. And once Kawariki's wow. father realized that the shark had saved them, and it was Tutira, uh, he was actually so impressed by this heroism, essentially, that he actually turned Tutira back into a human and apologized him by letting him marry Kawariki. So, I mean, here in this one myth, you've got a, a shark being a punishment, essentially, and kind of being feared mm-hmm. to suddenly being a hero. And... I think that's what a lot of people, it kind of mirrors what a lot of people are feeling nowadays with sharks. Um, Mm -hmm. In Massachusetts, I think it was last summer or the summer before, there was a great white shark that actually uh, washed up to shore and it was struggling. Like it was still alive. It was gasping for breath. And instead of people just Mm -hmm. sitting there taking pictures and being afraid of this animal, they actually formed a human chain to get water onto this animal's gills because that's how they breathe. They don't have lungs Mm -hmm. like you and I to keep it alive until help got there 
to bring it back into the ocean. Wow. And it's, I remember that. Video. Yeah, it was, I mean, it went viral and it's kind of like that mm-hmm. where I think, you know, yes, a lot of people still demonize sharks, but I think they're starting to realize how important these animals are. And that makes me really happy. My mom is a professional lifeguard, um, ocean lifeguard, and she uh, commands a a sort of field um, just outside of New York City that gets a lot of people from the city visiting. Um, And so it's people with, you know, varying degrees of like swimming, you know, uh, capacity and it's an ocean beach. Um, So they have like a number of rescues every single day. Um, And also being on the shores of Long Island, you know, there are whales and sharks and stingrays and like other kind of uh, ocean creatures that um, either are swimming, you know, right near where the bay there's normally would be or who wash up from time to time. Um, and I've definitely seen even over the course of my lifetime, you know, attitudes both at the like kind of park administration and just among like my mom and the people who are there every day, like keeping baiters safe. Um, that's less like, you know, how dare other creatures infringe on like our right to, to swim here or <laughs> boogie board or whatever. Um, and a lot more like, Hey, like this is nature. This is the ecosystem. Like we, you know, respect the ocean. And if we do that, then it respects us and, and stuff like that. Um, and more kind of interest as well on the public side of not being frustrated that you can't swim, but more like, isn't this amazing? Like we are here in the presence of an animal that is like so much older and bigger than we'll ever be. Um, so I, I'm hopeful in the sort of trajectory that that indicates for the future. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the phrases that irks me more than anything else is shark infested waters. And I'm like, no. where are they supposed <laughs> to go? That's their home. Yeah. Like I, I, it's literally. Yeah, I'm I like, know. I can understand it. If We're a they, human infested planet, right, right? I'm like, okay, I can understand it if they start coming onto shore, have grown legs, and you know, are at your local Walmart or something. <laughs> I get that. But, yeah. I mean, if they're in the water at that point, it's like, wouldn't it be the other way around, where it's human infested beaches? Which, to be honest, it kind of feels that right. way during spring break and summer. It certainly does. So Yeah, it really yeah, does. So, you know, I think, and I'm one of those people that if I see it in a headline, I I don't want to say I call out the journalist, but I do make a little bit of a stink of it, being like, are you kidding me? We're still doing this. Because it's just, words are so powerful. And... Mm-hmm. A lot of them have a bad connotation. Like if you notice when I said earlier, uh, shark encounter, fatal shark encounter instead of shark attack, because attack makes it seem as if they are planning this, like they are going to go after you. It is in their head. No, it's it's an encounter like. They do not. They a don't human, want humans. Like, threaten yeah, them. They don't want humans. We taste yeah. like crap to them. There is nothing about us that they find delicious. <laughs> like, if people get anything out of this, it's we're not on the menu for these guys and these gals. Like, just they don't want us. A lot of the times, when someone has an encounter with one of these animals, it is usually by an accident. And by that, I mean surfers on a surfboard that looks like a sea turtle or a seal. Uh, people wearing shiny jewelry, mm-hmm. people going, being in the middle of a group of bait fish, which is their some of their prey, um, people being mm-hmm. down current from a bloody fish or from fishermen having a ton of fish, and it's just like a chum slick is what we call it. So usually sure. there are sure. other factors that people don't pay attention to. And then, you know, there are the stupid factors of people going up and kissing sharks in the mouth, and then they're like, oh, why did it bite me? buddy, I'd bite you too if you (laughs) like kiss me on the mouth. So, you know, it's, they get a bad reputation. And I find it so funny that the statistics, you're more likely to get trampled by a cow or get struck by lightning or get smushed by a vending machine than you are ever of encountering a shark. And, you know, I don't, I don't see cow week. I don't see vending machine week. I don't see these statistics on vending <laughs> machines. Like, Because that will make Discovery Channel a lot of money. Cow week. That's what I'm looking forward to. Cow week. Yeah. Or like a 24-7 like goat live stream. You're like, hey, listen, those hooves are so sharp. That sounds yeah. like the dream. Yeah. <laughs> we 
are sponsored this week by Skillshare. Now, not only are the people at Skillshare some of the most amazing folks we've ever worked with, um, but Skillshare is also like the coolest website for learning anything you want. You can learn stuff about your profession, whether that's like marketing or coding or graphic design, and then stuff about hobbies like cooking and crafting. Last time I talked about claymation videos. That was Um, so cool. (laughs) But this week, Julia and I both took this course that I absolutely loved. Yeah, uh, the course is called Write a Fantasy Adventure, Discover Mythology and Create Your Epic Tale, which is so, so up our alley. It's ridiculous. Uh, So it's taught by Morgan Lindsay Nelson. She teaches you how to use mythology to inspire and expand your imagination, how to use it to spark an idea of your own original fantasy world, and how to write characters that readers will fall in love with and admire. Yeah, it is so cool. And it definitely plays upon some of those like narrative tropes and hero's journey type things that we talk about here on the show. And not only can you, you know, learn how to write your own fantasy novel or tale or audio drama or whatever it might be, but it also made me think a lot about Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and other fantasy novels that I've read before. Yeah, it's it really kind of lets you look into, oh, this is what the hero's journey is. These are the roles that these characters can play and help you utilize those both in your reading and your writing. And you can join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare with a special offer that's just for Spirits listeners. You can get two months of Skillshare for just 99 cents at Skillshare.com slash Spirits. That's Skillshare.com slash Spirits for two months of unlimited access to all 20,000 plus classes for just 99 cents. That is definitely, as Amanda said before, less than a popsicle. Hey, I can give no greater endorsement for a deal like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Right on. So thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring us, for supporting the show. And we'll send you back now to the episode. They get a bad reputation. And I think a lot of people, thankfully, are kind of starting to step away from the dramatization that a lot of journalists rely on when it comes to shark and step back and be like, wait a minute, is that actually what's going on? Um, So we're having a lot of advocates for sharks, which is a good thing in my eyes. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad. And if we were to, you know, read like an everyday, like lifestyle feature about a shark, like an article about a shark that isn't about, you know, they were doing their thing, a human got too close and was dumb, you know, or was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, Like, what do sharks do all day? What are they about? Like, what would like a cartoon shark, you know, what would their like profession be? What would a shark sitcom look like is what a man is asking. Yeah. (laughs) Um, well, I think it would depend on the shark because some of them do have to continuously keep swimming in order to breathe, but some of them do like being lazy. Mm-hmm. So if it's like <laughs> a big brother kind of house, one of them is going to be lazy. A lot of them are going to be swimming around. Nice. There's going to be love <laughs> triangles in which someone's pregnant and it can have like three fathers of those babies. <laughs> um, there's a lot of eating involved. Usually it's pretty messy eaters. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of them are party animals because they like to uh, be up at night. And a few fights here and there. Uh, Some teeth bearing, some hunching of their back, maybe uh, defending their territories and whatnot. So, I mean, I'd be interested in watching that. Heck yeah. (laughs) It seems like a it seems like a pretty legit episode of uh, Jersey Shore. I, honestly, I was just I was just gonna that. say it sounds much more interesting than Jersey Shore. <laughs> it's probably more educational. Uh, we're do, all do on the groom? same page. Oh yeah, no, we're all on the same page. All on the same page. <laughs> do they groom themselves? That's all really we need to be a full episode of Jersey no, Shore. No, you know it's funny. Um, some because they have parasites will actually brush up against other sharks. Like there are. <laughs> videos of smaller sharks using whale sharks kind of as like a scratching post to get parasites off of them. And there there are cleaning stations as well where a shark will actually uh, swim around or will stay kind of stationary and let animals come and pick off parasites not only (gasps) off of its skin, but actually in its mouth as well. So sweet. That's really cool. Yeah, it's amazing. (laughs) I I do not know... 
I do not know a lot about sharks, but I do know that the whale shark is my favorite shark because he's such a big boy. Yeah, <laughs> he's so big, he's such a big boy. They they actually start out really really small too, which mm-hmm. is mind blowing. But they're absolutely beautiful. And some really cool research just came out where you know the spots on whale sharks. Mm-hmm. They're kind yeah. of like our fingerprints. So each one has an individual marking pattern oh, so on cool. them, and so they're using technology from NASA that uh, is used for stars and constellations using it for these sharks to ID them. I just that's clutched amazing. my chest because that's the sweetest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> it's awesome. Is, it's, I mean, uh, it's, again, it's those marriages of uh, different science branches and different um, study branches that we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. who would ever think NASA technology would be beneficial for sharks. Mm-hmm. Like when I heard I that, I'm like, are you kidding me? This is amazing. But it makes sense. I mean, their patterns are basically constellations, but in our oceans. Yeah. And it's almost like we're all in one like interconnected universe where, you know, oh, everything from tiny electrons to like giant star systems are like made of the same stuff. I mean, I don't know. It's easy to kind of make jokes about in my head, but like nothing makes me feel more connected and alive and like transcendent than thinking about my place in the universe, whether, you know, I'm giant compared to the bacteria that live in me or I'm, you know, an, a speck of nothing in the sort of like space time continuum. In the grand scheme of things. Well, mm-hmm. speaking of constellations, there's actually a native tribal people of Brazil and Guyana, which actually believe the constellation Orion's belt isn't a belt, but it's actually the leg of a hunter uh, named Nohi Abasi, which he essentially kind of ticked off his mother-in-law. And uh, Nohi Abasi actually trained a shark to eat her. What he didn't Ooh. know was that his mother-in-law found out, disguised her daughter as the shark, and instead of going after the mother-in-law, the his sister-in-law, essentially, uh, <laughs> went after him and sawed off his leg. And that leg then became a constellation. That's so good. Amazing. <laughs> that sounds yeah, like my I, family drama. <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep looking at Orion's belt now, and my husband's a really big uh, constellations guy. He's really big into astronomy. We just got a telescope. And he'll, we always see Orion's belt wherever we are. And so he's like, oh, look, Melissa, it's Orion's belt. And I'm like, it's a leg. And he's like, what? <laughs> and I told him the story. And he's like, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> I'm You're like, honey, conflicted. you know who you married. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I was like, are you really surprised about this? And he's like, no, but I don't want anyone to get ideas. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, my my version of that is I was at a party with my partner the other day and uh, someone that we're friends with walked in and uh, he said, oh my God, like, like, Amanda, I'm so excited to see you here. I need to show you a picture, um, opened up his iPhone and showed me a photo and said, isn't my cat a lesbian? Just because his cat like looked like a lesbian in that photo. And I was like, yes, Christian, your cat is a lesbian. Uh, and it my partner looked at me like, oh my, like I, this is so unsurprising and also like so remarkable at the same time. <laughs> Uh, sidebar i need you to send me that photo of that lesbian cat like now. oh yeah i'll i'll let christian know christian former guest of spirits um and did a great episode on king arthur <laughs> oh, oh it was it was that christian i'm, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, upset yeah. that he didn't show me the lesbian cat now that's upset we were too excited talking about it yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> um so melissa can you share with us some more examples of sharks in folklore and mythology yeah um well we've got lasco uh, which is a half shark, half octopus sea monster. Which I I'm already love sh- it. Yeah, I My think son. they had a, a really bad sci-fi movie kind of based on that mashup called Shark Okay. Puss. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so Lasku has a pretty bad temper and is actually from Bahamian mythology. Mm-hmm. And Lasku is said to be responsible for sinking ships or drowning swimmers for causing whirlpools and is also apparently responsible for the blue holes and the sinkholes found along the island. And it's actually said that she will make a sinkhole whenever the residents of an island have angered her. 
Ooh. Oh, I um, thought you were going to say when a man spurned her, but like, same. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because actually the Bahamas back in 2011 banned shark fishing in its waters and prohibited the sale, importation, and export of shark products. So maybe that made Alaska happy. That's awesome. I mean, and also brings up like a an interesting sidebar, which is like sharks are sort of trapped in this dichotomy between like, you know, predator that no one should encounter at any cost and also like mythic being whose products are, you know, uh, sought after to the point of like, you know, being detrimental to the species. Well, yeah, like how I said earlier that not all folklore and conservation measures line up very nicely. Uh, The worshipping of sharks is very common in the Melanesian islands, especially the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea or PNG. Mm -hmm. And here some cultures actually believe sharks to be the living embodiment of ancestors. Ooh, now, yeah. PNG is home to quite a few threatened sharks, and with many cultures holding sharks in such high praise, one would quickly think that the relationship between humans and the sharks here is a good one. While the trade of shark fins is actually illegal there, many still indiscriminately kill and fin sharks to help keep mm. their families alive. Um, mm. It's not... They know it's illegal. They know it's not right. But that's the only way that they can get money, essentially, to live. It's not their fault. Yeah. No, exactly. So it's definitely a very interesting relationship that has a lot of nuances to it. I mean, it's kind of like how Dean Crawford said, no other animal elicits such fascination and fear as the shark. And that's what I'm seeing in a lot of these myths and a lot of these cultures is a lot of them either fear them or find them fascinating and revere them. Yeah, well, both are ways to like understand a thing that seems really not understandable or to other a thing, you know, like that that dichotomy is is really present in other places as well, where either it's like a thing you don't want to look at or a thing that you, you know, kind of abstract to the point of like, you know, not being able to like relate whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, speaking of relating, there's actually two pretty notable Greek myths that involve sharks that you ladies might know. Um, (laughs) There's the myth of Lamia or Lamia. Mm. And Lamia was the daughter of the sea god Poseidon. And she actually had an affair with Zeus. When Hera, Zeus' Classic. wife, of course, right? Like, that's a surprise. Never a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> so when Hera, Zeus' wife, found out about the affair, she actually stole and murdered Lamia's children, which drove mm-hmm. Lamia absolutely bonkers. And so to help her get revenge, Zeus actually turned her into a giant shark monster so she could <laughs> devour the innocent children of others as revenge. You know, oh so I did know that story up until the shark monster part, which I think makes it about 10 times better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting uh, how different cultures paint them. Uh, for mm-hmm. a lot of the Greek ones, I've kind of seen sharks as fearsome monsters, whereas more for mm-hmm. the Polynesian uh, islands. It's more of a respect or it was a monster, but we still respect it in a healthy sure. sort of way. <laughs> um, to to give the Greeks a little bit of credit, they did turn basically any creature you could find into a giant monster. So This is true. <laughs> that, that's, that's just not the sharks. It's, it's everything. This, this is true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then also for the Greeks... Uh, so for all of these names, I'm pretty sure some of them I'm butchering them and someone's probably listening to this being like, why in the world is she saying this? It's because I've written them a thousand times, but I haven't said them a thousand mm-hmm. times. So uh, do you guys know the story of Akahelios? Mm-hmm. Okay, so... I don't, but our listeners probably okay, don't, perfect. so go right okay, ahead. So Akahelios <laughs> is the son of Zeus and Lamia and was a lesser known sea god because he was he had a shark head and a fiery fish body. And Mm -hmm. he was turned into a shark as punishment after boasting that he was more attractive than the god of beauty, Aphrodite. (sighs) Just never do that. That just... No, you just don't... You you, just don't... You you know better. You just don't mess with the gods. That is the overlying arch lesson of most Greek mythology. 
Especially the super petty ones like Aphrodite. Mm. I mean, come on, dude. Exactly. Yeah, just like gossip with your girlfriends when you get home and like have a glass of sea wine. That's exactly. What you do. Don't actually go up to her and be like, mm, don't really like how you look. Oh, no. <laughs> well, speaking of morals of stories, there's actually a really interesting one in Zanzibar, which is the myth of not only a shark, but a monkey. And hmm. the myth of the monkey of the shark is pretty simple. It's about how a monkey living in a fruit tree and a shark became friends. And the monkey would help the shark eat fruit from the tree and the two would have a conversation and talk. And to repay the monkey, the shark usually offered to take him on his back to his home for a really big feast. It turns out the shark only befriended the monkey because his king was sick and he needed the monkey heart to cure him. And so when the monkey found out the shark's goals, he actually tricked the shark into thinking he had left his heart back at the tree. So the shark took him back to the tree where the monkey climbed up and then mocked the shark for being stupid and stayed in the tree. And so the moral of that story is apparently you're not supposed to <laughs> trust monkeys or sharks. <laughs> I mean, that is a good moral, I guess. I think, I think honestly, the definitely. lesson from here is don't, be, don't go befriending people for other reasons besides friendship, like ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> be upfront about your desire for your heart. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. if you want someone's heart, tell them. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, those are just some examples of myths and folklore that are out there. And then, of course, Hawaii. I mean, you can't go in this podcast without some from Hawaii and Hawaiians have a very complex mm -hmm. mythology surrounding sharks they actually for the most part revere sharks and their shark gods have helped protect people in the islands and I mean you've got shark gods that save shipwreck victims that protect the inlets and the islets and ensured fishermen had a bountiful catch that they protected people from shark bites that could transform into both a human and a variety of other sea creatures to help out people. So definitely their mythology surrounding sharks is, for, again, for the most part, a pretty positive one. That's, oh gosh, there, there's so many good stories. I like, I, I almost want to ask if you have a favorite one because you've, you've listed off so many good <laughs> ones that I feel like you probably have to have a favorite, right? Yeah, you know. <laughs> or the most shocking. <laughs> I think my favorite has to be the Fijian shark god, just because that was kind mm -hmm. of my entryway to everything. And, sure. I mean, the cool thing about uh, Dakuwaka is actually that it's known in a lot of different islands as something else. So in the Cook Islands, it's known as Avatia. And was also the god mm -hmm. of the sun and the moon. In Tonga, he was known as Takuaku or Takuaka, and was a warrior god that would protect people from other vicious gods. So I think just because it was kind of my entryway uh, shark myth into everything else, it has to be my favorite. It has a very special place in my heart, that's for sure. And you know, to me, this is such a great example of how understanding a thing is so much more interesting than vilifying it. Like mm -hmm. we know what a villain is, you know, like it's, it's, you can only have so many kind of interesting plot twists about like a character that you end up like needing to hate as part of a, a narrative um, and understanding them further digging in, you know, trying to like understand why our assumptions are what they are. Like, it's just, it's always the more interesting. Yeah. Choice. And you know, I feel like kind of this way. One of my other passions when it comes to studying sharks is habitat use. So answering why a shark is where it is. I think that in kind of the behavioral aspect of these animals, why it interests me so much is actually, do you guys remember the show, The Wild Thornberries cartoon? Yes, of course. Hell yeah. yeah. So I'm pretty sure Eliza Thornberry was the one who got me interested in marine biology, like as a career or just biology in general. Because I was so envious mm -hmm. of her ability to communicate with animals. Like, I wanted that superpower. Like, I yeah. wanted to ask the animals where they mm -hmm. went, why they did what they did, and to let them know that I was trying to help them. And I was going, like, when I was in 
undergrad, I actually would watch the shows in the background as I was studying for my tests. And I realized that they never did Aww. an episode really with sharks where they painted them as a good guy or a gal. Mm-hmm. And it was really interesting to me why even that, I mean, they even had the other animals that are also painted as villains like lions they, you know, talked about what they were facing. They got to uh, talk about the threats they were facing. And in the end, the lion was painted as a good person or a good animal. They never had that with sharks. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wish that, you know, if anyone could ever have a superpower, that mine would be to have that ability to communicate with animals to kind of get to know these animals on a deeper level. And I guess I hope at the end of all of this research that I'm doing, I get to understand not only the factors that influence the diversity of public interests and attitudes, but also how the portrayal of sharks has evolved over the years. And who knows, maybe through this work, we can evaluate the effectiveness of residential environmental education programs and look at the role of wildlife ecotourism uh, and what it plays in regards to the long-term coexisting with wildlife mindset. So I think by being able to study the personal and intimate relationships people have with the ocean, maybe we can predict how people's attitudes will influence these conservation policies and vice versa. And from there we can have more effective management and planning in the future, which means better protected sharks. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that is so awesome. I I'm so I'm so <laughs> glad we had you on. Like genuinely, yeah. I learned so Thank much. You. I mean, it's it's really interesting stuff. I am so struck by your like obvious passion and compassion and understanding and freaking <laughs> wicked intelligence. And I'm so glad that you are, you know, in part dedicating your career to helping people who are not biologists understand how freaking amazing the ocean and sharks in particular. Yeah, I, are. I mean it's a really important ecosystem. It is, I mean, we're called the blue planet for a reason. And these animals Mm -hmm. are an important part of that very important ecosystem. So it's just doing my part to make sure that we not only highlight and shine a spotlight on the diversity of sharks and how we go about forming our opinions of them, but also the diversity of scientists that are studying them. Uh, I actually am the founder of the Fins United Initiative, and that's a program that looks at diverse sharks and their relatives, but also highlights this different science that is going on in, around the world to study these animals. And we have a series called Behind the Fins, which we actually go around the world interviewing scientists, conservationists. We're actually now expanding to include wildlife artists, uh, photographers, videographers, conservationists whatever, um, a very broad spectrum. Basically, if you work these a- with these animals in some capacity, we're reaching out to hear your story. Uh, because I think it's really important to know what kind of research is going on, why it's beneficial, and again, see the, that diversity in scientists, break that stereotype of what a scientist, quote unquote, looks like. Absolutely. Oh, amazing. Well, listen, we will be a platform for you and your colleagues uh, any time you want. Just hit us up. We are here for it. We're here to listen and um, hopefully, you know, bring a few new uh, listeners or followers to your cause. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you. And again, thank you guys so much for having me on. This was it was such a different kind of podcast to be a part of, but I absolutely love it because there's nothing else like it out there. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's a very weird intersection of our, you know, Julia's and my particular loves. And I think the more people are able to like, you know, just showcase exactly and authentically who they are, what they care about, um, a, a niche that they feel only they represent, whether it's a Latina marine biologist or, you know, like a, a person who is super obsessed with like death gods from <laughs> cultures that you're not a part of, like that, you know, like, there's a place for you and there's a community around you. Um, and, you know, being able to f- find someone else who's like, oh my God, I thought it was just me. Like that is just the driving force. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, Melissa, do you want to plug any of your stuff where people can find you on the internet? I know you did at the beginning, but it's always good to do it again yeah, at the end. Uh, so you can find me on Twitter at MCM Sharks SS. Uh, I also have a website, which is just my full name, Melissa Christina And I'll send you guys all this information too if you want to put it in the show notes. Absolutely. Yeah. The Finns United Initiative has a Facebook, a website, an Instagram, and Conciencia Sul also has a Facebook, a website, and that's it for it right now. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm slowly dabbling into getting a, a, a Twitter handle as well, but I just started I with you. a Finns United Twitter handle. So I'm like, all right, two, two Twitter handles is good for right now. <laughs> oh, we <laughs> feel that's, that. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, we definitely do. <laughs> so yeah, I'll definitely send you guys all that information. And then of course the Ted talk, uh, if people want to check that out and I guess, hint, hint, uh, keep an eye out for a special week's all about sharks this summer because you might see mm-hmm. a familiar face. Ooh. Hell yeah. Oh, my God. It's like the most famous person we have, we've ever talked to. <laughs> <laughs> all cool. right. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. And remember to our listeners to stay creepy, stay cool, and just keep swimming. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just $1 gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time.